Your window of opportunity is opening, but is your business ready for what's coming? Be good surprises and bad surprises ready. Be new markets, no problems ready. Be pay family leave ready. Be ready with SAP. Visit sap.com slash be ready. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II podcast, episode 410, Four Torpedoes Can Make All the Difference. Last time, August 12th, 1942, it was coming to a close. Admiral Seifert's Force Z was heading back to Gibraltar, leaving behind Force X and the merchantmen of Pedestal. Force X was on its own now, but Force Z had its own worries as well having lost several ships and almost losing the carrier Indomitable. The wounded carrier's captain, Tom Trowbridge, was fat but fearless, and he was a direct descendant of Horatio Nelson's Captain Trowbridge, and it's a good thing he was fearless. During the attack that saw his carrier smashed, the radar had picked up close to 170 enemy planes, all kinds, approaching in 11 formations, at heights that varied from 25,000 feet to 10,000 feet. But, as we have seen, it was the dive bombers that delivered the most damning blows. And the more that Trowbridge had thought about it, he had agreed with one of the pilots, who said, We had been taken in by the oldest trick in the book. A major force draws off the defenders down sun, whilst a hitting force drives out of the sun during the diversion. An assessment that was correct, and now the Indomitable was limping back to the rock. But the next day would see the other carrier, Victorious, serve up a bit of revenge, though served in a rather strange way. Remember as the carrier had entered the Mediterranean, an Air France flying boat had spotted the ships and radioed it to the entire world? Well, at the time, Captain Trowbridge had stayed his hand, and not hurt the little plane. But now, as he and his headed west, that same plane and pilot were flying over again, and Trowbridge was in quite a different mood, what, having lost 50 men, and his ship was now wrecked. Soon, four hurricanes from Victorious approached the airliner. Here's what the Vichy French pilot Commandant Marceau Marisay later wrote. The planes followed us for some minutes, when suddenly they approached square on to our right side, from which I could see the leader and one of his wing. As was traditional in our service, I waggled my wings in greeting. At this precise moment, I noticed the leader's plane go vertical and begin to turn towards us. Premonition? I don't know, but I pulled back on the four throttles, reducing the motors to a minimum and accentuating my descent, and turned to the left. And almost the same instant, I heard clear the dry clack of the bullets hitting our plane from the machine gun burst from the fighters, and curiously, I also smelled the odor of gunpowder. The commandant managed to land the plane in the sea, despite the damage, and the damage was considerable. Marisay got out and said he counted over 200 bullet holes. Not unsurprisingly, four of the passengers were now dead, and the rest were seriously wounded, Vichy protested strenuously, but London was not too upset. They got on with the war. Meanwhile, Malta, the hopeful recipient of Pedestal, was doing its part to help distract and disperse any coming Axis attack on the convoy. Two Malta-based bombers were sent to patrol the exits from Taranto in southern Italy, and five other sorties were sent to patrol the sea lanes between Sardinia and and Sicily. But it was one of the 12 sorties flown by Spitfires that day that spotted the Italian 3rd Cruiser Squadron, which had left Messina. Keith Park, RAF Commander and Vice Admiral Ralph Latham, Flag Officer in Charge, Malta, could not know specifically, but the 3rd Cruiser was going to rendezvous with the 7th Division and the heavy cruiser Trieste. Though this had happened at 10 a.m. on August 12th, Clearly, a part of the Italian fleet was meeting up to wipe out the convoy once Force Z was gone and Pedestal and Force X were in the narrow Sicilian Straits, or more specifically, the Scherchi Channel, in between Sicily and Tunisia. 
Later that day, a Maryland bomber would spot a cruiser and five destroyers. This surface force would be watched all day, mostly thanks to Pilot Officer Monroe, who had asked to be allowed to stay up as long as he had fuel. This was agreed to, despite Monroe having no experience with landing at night. Fortunately, he came down safe, and the enemy force was tracked until another could take over. But observation is meaningless without action taken, and the Malta-based pilots would certainly attempt to strike the enemy, though their offensive capabilities were on the pathetic side. For example, Comiso in southern Sicily, practically due north of Malta, would be hit twice that day. And even to make that happen, an old Wellington IC that had crash-landed on Malta was stitched up and sent up. The Wellington IC was the first main bomber production variant, which had waste guns added. But given what they may potentially go up against, the ICs, with a crew of six, had to be very careful. Adding to this, Pilot Officer Shepard, who had zero operational experience, volunteered to take up this old rickety bird. He and his made two bomb runs that day to distract the Axis air units there, but on the second go-around, the plane was hit by flak. Shepard got the old girl home all right, but there on the runway, she exploded, killing all inside. But what Keith Park and those on Malta hoped for the most was that their scratch force of 15 Beauforts and 15 bow fighters on constant alert that day of August 12th would be sent against an Italian formation moving to attack Pedestal. This left all of seven bow fighters to attack Pantelleria, again a diversionary tactic, but even this did not go right. Led by Wing Commander J.M.N. Pike, he and two others hit the airstrip there, smashing one parked plane, but the others had gotten lost on the way or they could not find their target. This, in total, was the contribution of Malta's airstrike forces. Admiral Burrow Force X and Pedestal seemed to be on their own. And yet it was the Italians' view that Malta was somehow a hornet's nest with dozens of bombers ready to go, which is why Rome never allowed its capital ships to operate south of Sicily without overwhelming fighter protection. But it was this misguided fear of Malta's air arm that held the Italians back to the point that Pedestal's destiny would be affected. On the flip side, the Italians convinced the Germans that all four carriers that had been a part of Pedestal were either now sunk or badly damaged, thus boosting their confidence. Still, the two Axis partners started arguing about who had, in fact, sunk the carrier Eagle. The Italians said it had been their torpedo bombers. The Germans claimed their U-boats had done the deed. Not exactly the best of partnerships. And that's leaving aside the general impression that the Italian's heart was not nearly into the war as much as the Germans. Scott for Scott's here. Do you hear that? Bring the mic in close. That's not how the grass should sound. There's weeds everywhere in this lawn. It's time to take action with Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It gets three jobs done at once, kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds your lawn so it keeps growing strong. Ah, oh, much better. Get a bag of Scott's Triple Action today. It's guaranteed, or your money back. Feed your lawn. Feed it. The only other diversionary attack that day was Operation MG3, led by Rear Admiral Sir Philip Vian. At dusk, back on August 12th, Vian had left Port Syed, Egypt, with three merchantmen, escorted by three cruisers and 12 destroyers. On August 11th, they were joined by another merchantman and two cruisers from Haifa. The idea was to advertise a tempting target, but at the same time, to have enough force on hand to more than hold their own. Again, it was to be a fight signifying nothing, except, of course, having that fewer planes, ships, or subs to go after pedestal. At 5 p.m. on the 11th, a U-boat spotted this convoy and reported it in. 
locating it about 155 miles or 249 kilometers west of Haifa, Israel. This sighting made Rome nervous. It was too well protected for just a convoy. Were the sneaky British up to something? Who could tell? But the first thing Rome did was clear the board. All shipping in most of the Mediterranean was shut down. Next, Italian cruisers left port to keep an eye on Vian's convoy. However, the Germans did not take the bait, as they still had most of their experienced anti-shipping squadrons, currently on Crete, make for Sicily. Then came the next part of this operation. That night of the 11th, Vian's ships dispersed and returned to their home ports. And as hoped, the morning of the 12th, Rome fairly freaked out as the convoy had somehow disappeared. But soon, cooler heads prevailed. In Kesselring and the Supermarina, the Italian Navy realized Pedestal was the main event. So all went back to focusing on its destruction. At 7 p.m. on August 12th, the entire Axis naval force, those dedicated to stopping Pedestal, joined up. They were now heading south through the Tyrian Sea, which meant they would be sailing just by the western coast of Sicily. Their objective was to meet up with Pedestal at dawn, just south of Pantelleria, and wipe it out. All of it, even the escorts. However, Vice Admiral Lathan, who was told of this force 18 minutes after it was spotted, felt confident that Force X, with Burrow in the lead, would be more than a match for the attackers. Maybe he was right. Maybe he wasn't. We will never know, because one submarine attack would alter the final game before it could be played, and that alteration was not in the favor of the Allies. Once again proving that geography determines destiny, the Skirki Bank, it goes by many names, the Sicilian Channel or the Strait of Sicily, is a broken limestone reef that can be likened to a row of bad teeth that goes across the waterway from Sicily to the Tunisian coast, which makes it one of the more shallow parts of the Mediterranean Sea. Too shallow for a heavy cruiser like the Nigeria, Burroughs' flagship, to sail through. However, there is a molar missing in this row of teeth, if you will, near Cape Bon on the tip of the Skirki Peninsula, of Tunisia. And there, the water was deep, deep enough for the deep drafts of the larger ships to sail through. Of course, looking at the same area conversely, it's a natural and perfect ambush point, and the Italians were not ones to look a gift horse in the mouth. They were sure to put e-boats there that could launch torpedoes, but more importantly, that morning of August 12th, Rome had six submarines take up a position on the northern approach to the deep water funnel that Pedestal would have to use. And even better for the Italians, and worse for the Allies, because it ran so near the North African coast, the escort's radar would find that locating enemy subs in that area would be challenging at the very least, given the natural obstacles of the coast that affected the signals going out. Behind this line of subs was another line, this one made up of 19 E-boats in all. And this line was about to get stronger, as the Germans were sending, at that very moment, six of their own boats from Crete. The phrase, shooting fish in a barrel, comes to mind. As they approached the Narrows at 7.46 p.m., Admiral Burrow had the merchantmen go from four columns to two in order to squeeze through this narrow pass. Also, he sent the three minesweeping destroyers, the Intrepid, Icarus, and Fury, on ahead. Burrow had to assume that mines had been laid out there, and indeed they had. Now, before this moment, when Force Z had been with them, Pedestal had been able to simply depth charge its way through. There had been six Italian subs to go up against two dozen destroyers of the screen. That's four destroyers per sub. But now, things had changed. With Force Z gone, Burrow had nine destroyers to watch over the merchantmen. And with other Italian subs coming into the area, it would now be nine destroyers against 11 subs. 
The math was ugly and could lead to uglier things. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Commander Venato Farini, captain of the submarine Axum, watched the last of the evening's air attack. As he was far away, he could only see the smoke billowing from the damaged Indomitable. Only after the Axis bomber stopped did Farini begin to chase the convoy at a depth of 60 feet. At 7.27 p.m., he was within four and a half miles of pedestal. At 7.33, he spotted 15 steamers, two cruisers, and several destroyers. At 7.37, he was within 4,000 meters. At 7.42, he closed in. At 7.48, he noted that he was at periscope depth and had worked out an attack against a cruiser, a destroyer, and a large merchant ship. Hindsight allows us to know that he got most of that right. The cruiser was the Cairo, and in front of her was not a destroyer, but the cruiser Nigeria, Admiral Burroughs' flagship, and the large merchantman, that was the tanker, Ohio. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity, when your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be good surprises and bad surprises ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there and can help you be ready for anything that happens next. Because it will. Be ready with SAP. Visit sap.com slash be ready. On board the Nigeria was Anthony Kimmins of the BBC. He broadcasted, At about a quarter to eight that evening, there was a welcome lull in the air combats. Remember that everyone in those ships had been fighting almost continuously since daylight, and apart from the heat of battle, there had been the grueling heat of the Mediterranean sun. Now in a temporary lull, men slipped off their anti-flash helmets and gloves and seized the opportunity of cooling off. Back to Commander Farini. At 7.55, he noted, Fire bow tubes in order. One, four, three, two, of which one and two straight, three and four angled respectively to five degrees to starboard and five degrees to port. Directly after firing, disengage. Distance at firing from first line, 1,300 meters. From cruiser, 1,800 meters. 63 seconds after firing, here, first explosion. Back to the BBC broadcaster Kimmins, he later wrote, Some of us had gone down for a moment to the navigator station. Suddenly there was a flash, a terrific explosion, and complete darkness, as the lights and most other things were shattered. A U-boat had got a torpedo home on us. The ship immediately started to list, and as we groped our way to the door and forced our way out through the fumes, the ladders were already well over at an angle. By the time we reached the bridge, Admiral Burrow and the captain were leaning across the starboard side, looking rather like yachtsmen at the tiller of a boat, heeling well over to a fresh breeze. Some of the ship's company were already groping on the upper deck in the most orderly fashion, and as they did so, they looked up to the bridge for orders. There was never a sign of panic, but the ship was assuming a somewhat alarming angle, and the memory of the eagle was still fresh in our minds. But any doubts anyone may have had were immediately removed by the admiral. Don't worry, she'll hold, he shouted. Let's go have a cigarette. And whatever momentary effect that great explosion may have had was removed in a flash by that casual remark. From that moment, everything in that ship was carried out like an ordinary peacetime exercise. Now, that's why Burrow got paid to keep the men on task to complete the mission. However, he also had 52 less men to stay on task. They were now dead. A 21-year-old rating would later describe the scene. With massive damage amidships, we could hear water rushing into the HMS Nigeria, down by the bow, and with the stern rising, she was in danger of going down. Everything was out of action. The guns, radar, radio, steering, all gone. Flames were leaping out of one of the funnels with the diesel on fire. 
Down below, 50 officers and men had perished, and others were wounded, some mentally. Admiral Burrow, besides his calm, saw the writing on the wall, or whatever the naval version of that saying is. He wrote, The ship immediately assumed a list of approximately 15 degrees, and I realized that she would not be able to take further part in the operation. I immediately ordered Ashanti, a destroyer, to close as I felt it was vitally important that I should regain contact with the convoy, who were moving southeast at about 14 knots. At 2020-820, Ashanti came alongside Nigeria and, after satisfying myself that Nigeria was no longer in danger of sinking, I embarked with my staff and proceeded to rejoin the convoy. Back to the Italian sub, Commander Farini had cause to add this to his report not 30 seconds later. This leads me to assume a hit on a unit in the first line and successfully on one in the second line. Calculating from speed of torpedoes, distance on firing was less than estimated, being actually about 1,000 meters from the first line and 1,400 from the second. When Cairo was hit by the Axum's second and third torpedoes, parts of the ship and some of her crew flew hundreds of feet into the air. Twenty-six men died, and the ship's stern was suddenly beyond repair. Those that had survived this initial blast then had to worry about the return of that metal and body parts as gravity reasserted itself. The Cairo's captain, Hardy, was told that the ship was settling by the stern while taking a list to starboard, and the port propeller was lost. As there was no chance of getting back underway, the captain said, I decided to sink the ship. With that, Captain Hardy and just over 200 other men transferred to the destroyer Wilton, and then the Wilton with the Bicester and Derwent followed the damaged Nigeria back to Gibraltar. Then Captain Hardy asked the captain of the new destroyer Pathfinder to finish off his ship, the Cairo. A man in the same room as Captain Hardy described the scene. Captain Hardy sat on the bridge, chin in hands, and watched the destroyer wheel about. A torpedo hit Cairo amidships, and she went up in a cloud of smoke. It was a heartbreaking sight after getting so far towards Malta. But just as soon as the Cairo was going under, the captain of the Pathfinder ordered full speed, as he had just received the following message. A force of enemy cruisers was now being reported on a course and at a speed which would enable them to reach the convoy during the middle watch. Admiral Dazara's convoy smashing fleet was getting into position. But what the crew of the Pathfinder did not know, hell, many of Pedestal did not know at first, was that Farini, when he had fired those four torpedoes, had not hit two ships, the Nigeria and Cairo. He had also struck the tanker SS Ohio, which was now aflame. That is, the lone tanker which had 11,500 tons of kerosene and diesel fuel within her. While the escorts fought the Axis forces, the Ohio's crew fought the flames, a fight they could not afford to lose. Postscript. As I increase my knowledge of things nautical, I wanted to better describe a depth charge attack. A depth charge, it looks like an oil drum, I think it is an oil drum, is launched from a surface ship, like a destroyer, and it goes about 50 yards from the sender. Then it's 300 pounds of TNT inside take over as it falls back to the earth, or in this case, the sea. The drum rolls over and over as it sinks at 8.5 feet per second. That is, until it reaches the setting it has been given to detonate. And as you can hear from like old time videos, there's a muted thump, and then a white ring spreads out from the spot where it went under. And in the center of that ring is a white geyser that can go 50 feet into the air. Of course, if an enemy sub is hit, as intended, the water quickly turns an ugly brown, 
That's the oil that should still be in the sub. And if that comes out, then chances are other things, like men, have left the sub as well.